Hello, this is Steve Buchanan. Um, I'm just uh, give it, doing a post-mortem uh, on a case that I did as a live demonstration March 29th, um, Friday, last Friday. Um, this is a very uh, challenging case. There's a crown in place, so we can't see if there's a pulp chamber. Uh, it turns out there was no pulp chamber. This was originally planned as a dynamic guidance case. Uh, it would have been a really awesome one as I'll get into later, but uh, uh, we had a video feed failure on the XNAV device and so it went from a guided case to an unguided case. We already had it scheduled so the show must go on. Uh, I can't tell you that I really enjoyed it. <laughs> it was a bear. Um, I uh, was mentally visualizing perforation and humiliation throughout most of all the access. Uh, it took an inordinately long time to find the palpable and distal buccal canals, but um, the outcome I was proud of. So let's look at it, uh, start looking at the uh, anatomic challenges besides perhaps calcification. There is a 90 degree curvature of the MB root immediately above the cervical of the CEJ. Um, this is a great opportunity to break a file. This is going to influence the choice of the taper for the final shape, this is going to end up, my expectations preoperatively and postoperatively, it turned out to be the case. Um, sticking to 04 tapers, that was going to be fine. We look at the distal view of this mesobuccal root, and despite this wild curve at the cervical area, um, we can see some very unusual anatomy. It's rare to see this kind of 3D anatomy in our 2D imaging, but in this case, we're lucky. This is what was in there, uh, an MB1, MB2, uh, confluent mid-root, looks like a little knot there almost, and then a bifurcation of the, that canal system. Um, looking at the CT projection of the buccal roots in their non-foreshortened uh, uh, position allows us to um, look at the mesobuccal root. We see an MB1 and MB2 here. It's the exact reflection of what we saw um, in the conventional case. Um, so that's reassuring. We look at the distal buccal. Distal buccal root looks like it has an apical bifurcation. And so we'll find out postoperatively if that turned out to be the case. Uh, sometimes when you do these live demos, you don't really want to talk about what could be seen later. It's a little disappointing when it doesn't turn out that way, but uh, in this case, uh, all the anatomy that we saw preoperatively was addressed and, uh, and displayed in the post-op fill. So let's talk about guidance, um, why guided versus non-guided. This, this case should have been guided. Um, dynamic guidance is one of the greatest gifts to the recent endodontics. The worst part of being an endodontist in the cases that we have to take are, without a doubt, are the, uh, are, are the uh, calcified cases. They're difficult to do. It's easy to hack a tooth up. Um, it's hard to look good even when you find them. And uh, implant surgeons can do guided implant surgery with static guides without this dynamic guidance. We can't use static guides to do what we need to do here. I spent eight years trying to do that. Dynamic guidance is the only thing. It's a bigger contribution to endo than implant surgery. So um, basically, instead of conventional access, Still, making it conservative without guidance, it's going to be in the mesial half of the tooth. We're not going to go past the, the buccal groove. Um, it's going to be to the working cusp, the palatal. It's going to be a millimeter and a half or two short from the mesial buccal. Uh, the mesial wall is going to be typically about two and a half millimeters back from the contact area at an angled at an, the mesial angle of the, the root structure. Instead of this, however, we would have had this three separate 1.25 to 1.5 millimeter openings, one for the palatal, the DB, and the mesial buckle, and that would have been it. Now, that, that's a sweet thing. I love doing those kind of cases. If you need to make it bigger, you can connect the dots there. It's still going to be a smaller access than it would have been otherwise. So, what do we need to keep in mind when we're freehanding? Well, freehanding without comb CT is a uh, fool's errand. Um, you're just an idiot if you do it. It's not, I mean, you can be super talented, but uh, even when you're super talented, if you don't have the right imaging, you just don't know what we're going to find inside there. So the first thing is let's make sure we get good views of these roots. If we're not, if we're looking at them at cut angles, at oblique angles, 
we won't really understand the dimensions of the canals, their distance from each other, their positions in relationship to each other. So first off, we want to get slice angles that are exactly across these canals, both in the X, Y, as well as the Z plane. So when we're looking at them, we have a very 90 degree view plane. Here it is, the same thing. For the buckle view plane, we're going to be looking at these two planes as uh, and the axial view as our primary reference points. So, uh, of all the measurements, all landmarks we check, the most important is the z-plane. The depth that we're going to be able to, that, that we're going to have to stop at um, to avoid cutting beyond the pulp chamber floor or what used to be the pulp chamber floor. So here we are looking at the mesial view. This is the paddle on the left, the distal buckle on the right. Uh, measuring from the mesial buckle cusp on the right, the paddle on the left, uh, up to where the pulp chamber floor should be. It's um, pretty much seven millimeters up. You take, uh, put the taper diameter that you're gonna use to gain new depth, put it on your millimeter gauge, put a Sharpie mark at seven millimeters, and you know not to go past that. In this case, it turned out to be critically important because there was no pulp chamber, and it's almost certain that I would have cut past, uh, past the orifices and ended up finding them up the wall somewhere um, and maybe having to do a, uh, a perforation repair with uh, bioceramic. Uh, fortunately, this Z-plane reference really kept me out of trouble in that regard. So we look at the buckle view. Um, after cutting to that seven millimeter depth, the um, MB orifice is the only one that was located. Could not find, hunted, hunted for the distal buckle and the paddle. Uh, the things that helped me find the, the, the the paddle first and then the distal buckle was the, um, the fact that we have 2.8 millimeters distal to the mesial buckle, which we have located, is where the distal buckle is going to be. It's going to be parallel to the line across the root structure. So you just put a perioprobe in there and measure from the MB1 back, and that's where the distal buckle is going to be located. In this case, with the root structure the way it is, uh, drawing a line at 90 degrees to that buckle line is going to give us uh, the line across which the paddle orifice will be intercepted. We still don't know how far along that line, so let's look at the mesial view of the tooth. We see that this is distance from the MB, which we've located to the paddle, is about 5.38, 5.4 millimeters. We go back to the Axial view, measure that out, and we can do this with our perio probe looking down from the occlusal view, and that indeed is how I found those two canals. Not easy. Um, I got to tell you, it's a long distance away, uh, five, six, uh, even almost seven millimeters away from, from the MB to the paddle orifice. That's a lot. So uh, let's review the instrumentation cone fitting that occurred in these canals. The mesial buckle had a significant mid root impediment. That was where those two canals, MB1 and MB2, were confluent and looked like a little, a little knot, <laughs> and then they bifurcated off. Um, I had to bend stainless steel files to get around that. I had to bend a 1504 Vortex Blue um, and get that past the impediment uh, to get a shape cut to the terminus of the MB1. Um, by rotating that by hand, I was able to cut it to length. Then, uh, bending a 1506 Vortex Blue uh, putting the tip of that around past the impediment, doing that by hand, and then clicking the handpiece onto that latch grip and spinning it to length in one fell swoop. Um, completed that and actually removed the impediment. Once that shape was established, a 10K file that was unbent, just like the gutta percha cones and all the other files, unbent instruments would glide around that cur severe curvature and go to and through the end of the root canal. Once uh, that initial shape with a 1504, 1506 was cut, then a uh, gauging file was used, a 15K file slipped through, the 20 bound at length, the 30 stepped back quite a ways, so a 2004 GTX file was chosen to finish, it was cut to length. Uh, these shapes are almost all just two files, one to rotate negotiate and initially cut shape, the second to do the, the completion of the shape. Obviously in the GTX system, uh, the gutta percha cones fit extremely closely to the file finishes, uh, the, f the shapes that the files finish, and a 2004 fit right to length and was then cut a half a millimeter back. Just a buckle, uh, almost the same thing. There's no impediment, however, so the 
4 was cut to length, uh, followed by the 1506, and then a 2004 GTX file to finish 2004 GTX. Got a Percha cone to cone fit, again, easily fit right to length. If um, For those of uh, us doing these minimally invasive shapes, especially the gentle waivers, it's um, one thing to want to cut minimal shapes, but it's another the thing to fit a cone predictably. Um, there's nothing as effective as getting a 2004, just a 2004 to length, even sometimes a 1504. Um, and with a smooth pathway, the cone should go right to length. The paddle, uh, typically uh, larger. We see the cone fit here being like four millimeters short. That was uh, an error of uh, got a perch cone kind of moving out of the canal as the other points were put in place. So it was just put back to place, uh, fit into this 3006 shape. I'm now about three quarters of a millimeter short of length. The cone was submitted and uh, the fill went to the terminus. So let's look at the post-op uh, results and the imaging. Cone beam CT imaging, we have a good uh, reflection of the mesial buckle shape and curvature. Here's the mesial buckle pre-op, and here's post-op. Look at that. So we knew that it joined and bifurcated. Uh, I didn't really know preoperatively that it, it was actually a trifurcation of the canal system at that point. We could also see the fill backwards from the point of con, uh, confluence back towards the pulp chamber. We see the ex coronal extent of that. That's where it was uh, non non-existent. I cut a trough that was about three millimeters deep there looking for it, could not find it, and then just depending on the gentle wave system to do the cleaning, and as evidenced by the fill, um, you can't put bioceramic sealer where there's not space cleaned out to put it. I can't claim any exact disinfection, but the bioceramic sealers liberate calcium hydroxide as they set. That is by antibacterial, and so if we can put the sealer there, even if there's a bug left, we can have a fair bit of confidence that it's either going to be entombed and or um, killed by the uh, basic pH of the calcium hydroxide. Looking at the distal buckle, preoperatively we thought there might be an equal bifurcation. Again, like the mesial buckle, it turned out to be more complex than that. We see in the first view here, showing the palatal on the left, the DB on the right, uh, the expected apical bifurcation. However, upon looking at a sharper, crisper view, we can see that one, but as the root is rotated around the distal buccal primary canal, we see there's another one. So this canal system as well had three apical portals of exit. All in all, a really one of, the most, one of the most difficult live demonstrations I've ever done, and I've done thousands of them, um, but uh, really proud about how it turned out. And I think a good, uh, a good teaching case for those who don't have dynamic guidance or trying to work their way through it, um, uh, I can definitely say without CT imaging, uh, there's no chance that you're going to find these canal systems or even know it's up there. And the key to minimally invasive access cavities is you're not going to be doing exploratory through the access. We're, cu we're not cutting them big enough to hunt around and find things. We, we hunt around and find them preoperatively on the, uh, in the three-dimensional volumes and then we know exactly where to look, especially when we have guidance. So to review the case uh, uh, points that were unique, first off, it was not guided, but still conservative, relatively conservative. It was kept in the mesial half, the, the occlusal surface. And um, however, it would have been smaller if it had been dynamically guided. Minimally invasive endodontic canal shapes. Uh, the buckles kept to an 04, the palatal kept to a 3006. In spite of those small shapes um, and the fact that I couldn't find the MB2, Genowave stepped in and uh, helped me out in, in ways that I couldn't operate with instruments. Despite these minimally invasive shapes, multiple portals of exit, three in the mesial, three in the distal, only one of each instrumented in each of those roots. A very three-dimensional result. Uh, poo poo it if you want, but the uh, thrill to fill is still a thing that uh, brings excitement to those clinicians that spend the time, <clears throat> invest the effort, and uh, care enough to, to give it their best and come up with, hopefully in these occasions, um, something really satisfying that helps you feel confident about the outcome. This 
ends the uh, review. There will be some questions being posted, answers to questions that you were kind enough to send in that we haven't answered yet will be, um, will be posted after this. This is the fourth or fifth live demo we've done posted to the internet. Uh, this last one, 1,300 people were watching live all over the world, which is just mind blowing to me. And um, I'm grateful to every one of you. Uh, keep watching. We'll keep trying to throw interesting cases, new technology, new tools, new ways of thinking about it, because we're all in it for the same thing. We love saving patients teeth for them when it makes sense. And uh, with today's technology, it's never been easier. So this is Steve Buchanan signing off. Um, see you at the next, uh, the next live demo, which is coming up, I believe, this Thursday afternoon. It was originally set for Friday. Um, Thursday afternoon is better for everybody because nobody wants to give up their Friday evening. We figure Thursday evenings, for those in the uh, East Coast, are going to be uh, just fine about that. And uh, anyway, so please tune in next time. I'm signing off, and I'll see you at the Apex.